and welcome to the Crate and Crowbar, episode 103, being recorded on Tuesday the 28th of July. I'm Marsh Davis and I'm joined this week by Graham Smith. Hello. Tom Francis. <laughs> Hello. And Tom Senior. Yeah, hello. hello. That's a very highly amped introduction. <laughs> what highly amped news have we got this week, Tom? Um, so people are getting very amped and playing games very quickly as part of the Summer Games Done Quick. I think that's what it's called, right? Yeah. Because it's normally called Awesome Games Done Quick, but if it happens in summer, it's called Summer Games Done Quick, because they're not awesome <laughs> if you play them in summer. <laughs> By comparison to the outside world, which is better in summer, they seem less awesome. It's a thing where people speedrun games, um, and people watch them speedrun games on a live stream, and then people donate money to Doctors Without Borders, in this case, um, as oh. they watch. And it's been fantastically successful in the past. They raise loads of money. Um, and they do stuff like, if There'll be decisions that the that the, um, the runners have to make, like, shall we play this one on impossible difficulty, or shall we play it on easy, or shall we, if we're doing Bioshock, shall we kill all the little sisters or save them all, and that kind of thing, like, sort of optional ways to play the game, and they put those to the vote, but you have to donate to vote, so you kind of, you put money behind, there's something, I actually don't know what game they're talking about, but every time someone donates, they say either kill all the animals or save all the animals, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know which game that, that's going to happen in. Um, but I tuned in this morning to see Bioshock Infinite being speedrun, and it's so interesting. I love speedrunning community, um, just because it's a kind of it's an interesting sport or an interesting challenge in itself. And then often it's it's the pleasure of watching someone extremely skilled play something perfectly. And then also it kind of brings out something about the game's personality. Like some games, like Half Life Two, actually ended up being it was an amazing speedrun to watch. Um, this wasn't in the latest. Um, lot that I've seen, but like that was the first one um, that where I followed the speedrunning community's investigation of that game and saw them optimize it out. And because that game's so scripted and so story driven, the way they speedrun it is basically break it and just like hover a box in front of Alex's head so that she can't go where she wants to go, and therefore she teleports there and she gets there faster, <laughs> like stuff like that. Um, and occasional moments of absolute brilliance. But then, so Bioshock Infinite. The, <laughs> I don't know what it says about the personality of Bioshock Infinite, but the way you speedrun that game is to get the volley gun, which is like a grenade launcher type thing, and point it at your feet and run along repeatedly firing grenades at your own feet to like blow yourself up um, hard enough to break your shield, because you have like this recharging shield, hmm. and when it shatters you get this big like orange glass effect breaking in front of your face, and when you don't have the shield... The game thinks you're in trouble and that you're about to die, and so it gives you a speed boost. So you run like 50% faster when you don't have your shield. Huh, but no you way. can't turn off the shield or get rid of it. You have to have a shield. And so he just has to spend the whole game shooting himself in the foot to get rid of the shield <laughs> to get his speed back. <laughs> wow. And then um, the other main way they, they save time is that obviously it's a very gated game and there's, it's a long series of checkpoints where um, you get to an area, a bunch of enemies flood in, you've got to kill them all before you can progress because Elizabeth has to pick a lock, and she won't pick the lock until the enemies are gone. Um, and that's kind of the main way they get you. Um, and it sounds like they've been pretty good about making sure there's no sort of, like, glitches about walking through walls or anything, um, unless you're dead. <laughs> so after hurting yourself repeatedly to try and get rid of your shield to get a speed bonus for being injured, you then have to kill yourself whilst throwing yourself at certain gates, like <laughs> the ones that Liz are supposed to unlock. If you're dead when you fly through them, <laughs> the collision checking is not so good. So you can no. like, go through bars and land your corpse on the other side. <laughs> and you can't actually... I'd actually kind of forgotten how death worked in Infinite, but um, instead of Vita Chambers, Elizabeth just revives you. Mm -hmm. She revives you, not like exactly where you were, but just the nearest checkpoint. And so if you go through the gate, then they assume you were through the gate when you died, and therefore uh, you must have cleared the previous area and she'll res you there. So both she and you did therefore teleport through the barrier <laughs> to bring you back to life. So just by weird coincidence, like those two things don't seem to have anything to do with each other, but both of the main speedrunning te techniques for Bioshock Infinite involve repeatedly harming yourself. <laughs> It sounds amazing. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's all archived, so you can probably watch that one. Um, I didn't see it all the way through, but I saw it. I tuned in, like, in the latter third of the game, I think. It takes them, like, two hours to go through the whole thing. <laughs> Do they discuss how, like, the techniques they're using as they're doing it? Yeah, that's the other amazing that's thing. That, um, not only... I mean, loads of things are amazing about it. Like, when I was interested in the speedrunning community, when I was kind of covering it for PC Gamer, um, the... The way it was going was that you didn't really do a speedrun by yourself. You just the whole community would upload segments, and so mm -hmm. Half-Life Two done quick, which is a big speedrunning kind of um, concerted effort. Uh, people 
like ev almost every segment was by a different person or you'd see a couple of familiar names popping up again and again because they were really good but it was whoever got the best time on that segment then they just upload their run and I think they uploaded the save game as well so you'd have the same health as them if you wanted to carry on from it hmm. so whenever you if you want to optimise a segment you take the latest save before that that's the, got the best time so far and uh, take it from there and um, so it's amazing that they can just go up and live <laughs> just do a speed run from the beginning all by themselves without uh, the ability to kind of restart and you know improve their lot particularly if you've ever tried to speed run something Jesus Christ you just <laughs> you fuck like the simplest thing up just walking down a corridor and going through a door you'll fuck it up nine times before you get it right like just to an acceptable level where you didn't get caught on the geometry or whatever um, and these guys do screw up every now and then but um the Bioshock Infinite guy, he screwed up by, he was just like looting a corpse and he accidentally picked up a vigor. And, um, there's only a couple of things in the game you actually want. Um, and so it's like the rocket launcher, the volley gun, and you don't want any vigors ever. And because he doesn't have any vigors, if he picks up this vigor, uh, he can't get rid of it because he can't replace it with anything. You can't sort of drop one. And it was one that is called tunnel vision and it increases your damage if you look down in sights, but decreases it if you don't. And of course, the speedrunner does not spend a lot of time standing and carefully aiming. <laughs> so it was basically like 25% debuff on all the damage he'll do for the rest of the wow. speedrun. <laughs> it's like, okay, this is hard mode now. <laughs> these guys, uh, these people are basically just the best QA testers ever. <laughs> you just thought they, they, they can kind of see how the game works in ways that, you know, as ordinary players just don't. Yeah. That's fuck with it. Anyway, I was sort of trying to answer your question about the talk, um, mm. and they do. Somehow they, they speedrun games. Uh, you know, on the spot, getting almost everything right, and can just seemingly in a very relaxed manner just analyse what they're doing and talk about the history of how that we've got to discover all while doing like that top level play. That's awesome. They often have like a couple of other people on the couch behind them, and some of those are pros at it too, and so they'll be saying, oh, the reason he did that is because if you need to control the spawning of the enemies and you don't want to get in a situation where this happens. There was a great one at, I think it was the last Awesome Games done quick. Uh, where they were playing V V V V V V, yeah, uh, and describing the techniques for skipping parts of those levels, um, and describing the way that the game rendered sprites such that there are certain frames of animation during which collision detection isn't active. So if you get it on the right frames, you can phase through certain things. Um, but one of the cool things that were that happened in that was that Terry Kavanagh, who made the game, called up live during the stream. And it was a little bit awkward because they there was like time delay and they couldn't quite hear each each other and that sort of stuff. But they were able to, you know, have Terry Kavanagh asking questions of this guy as he's, awesome. as he's speedrunning it. It's really fascinating. That's, worth, that's worth watching. It's it's amazing how a simple two D platforming game can be broken. Like you don't even yeah. realize the complexities involved in just making collision work to the extent that. You know, you just go, it's a given when you play Mario that all, all that collision is just in place. And of course, when that sprite touches that sprite, it's fine. But then computers are just really bad at that. <laughs> and that and there just seem to always be ways to exploit it in any game, which is awesome. Unless you're actually making games. Which <laughs> that's, that is not awesome. <laughs> I said that at Test Builder Gunpoint once and um, very quickly got some feedback from a test saying, you can jump through every wall in the game. <laughs> 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 oh, okay. <laughs> I don't try that. I don't think you can jump through walls, so I don't do it. <laughs> What else has been happening this week? Well, just a few hours ago, it was confirmed that Mafia 3 is in development, and the first announcement trailer will be released next Wednesday, okay. which is during Gamescom. Mm -hmm. um, it had previously been rumoured that the game was in development. There were rumours last month um, when people spotted that Mafia 3 dot com and mafia three the game dot com had been registered by two K, uh, causing everyone to wonder, ooh, what does this mean? <laughs> <laughs> um, and it's been rumored for years that there were lots of stories back as far as two thousand and twelve that it was in development at Illusion Softworks or Two K Check as they're now known, who are the, the creators of the series were working on it, and it was mooted to be kind of launch title for next gen, and then there were stories about how development was troubled. Um, that they didn't have the staff to finish it, they were having problems, it was being delayed. This was a fair little time ago now. And now that it's been confirmed that it's actually in development, it turns out it's the lead developers at the very least, maybe the sole developers, are a company called Hangar 13 Games. They're a new studio 
Um, they've never made anything before, but it's led by, I think it's Hayden Blackman, who is one of the main designers of Knights of the Old Republic, and then, uh, less impressive, The Force Unleashed. Oh, oh well, never mind about that. <laughs> is that a good um, fit, though? I don't know. Those are such I different mean, games, like, yeah. co- like Knights of the Old Republic. Well, yeah. well, The Force Unleashed had a good storyline, yeah. really. Hmm. Yeah. Jake Starkiller. Jake, well, uh, was his name Jake? It was, it was, it was Starkiller, I think. Let's, was, let's, yeah, let's but, focus on the part of the name. It's actually, actually dumb. Um, Still <laughs> Starkiller, yeah. Uh, but yeah, no, it, I, I remember, well, I say good. I remember it being better than the uh, the other Star Wars offerings at that time, right. which includes <laughs> the prequels, obviously, so it's not really a high bar to vault. Um, but yeah, no, it was, it was a rubbish game mechanically, but... Uh, hmm. uh, it's physics stuff, like... Um, was it natural motion kind of AI physics-y where they tried to grab onto things as you force push them off ledges? Yeah, no, the first game to have that in it, I think. And each other, they would uh, yeah. lift up a stormtrooper, and then his friend would be dangling okay. off his leg yeah. and grab <laughs> each other. That that would look good, but it just obviously didn't make you feel powerful hmm. uh, in the way that the, the force requires the players <laughs> to feel powerful. But uh, yeah, no, I, you guys excited about Mafia Three? I was a bit lukewarm on Mafia Two, to be honest. Mm. Well, everyone seemed to be lukewarm on Mafia Two, or think that it was total shite. No. Um, and so I don't think it was total shite. That's, nah. a, that's <laughs> a bit harsh. And there's a lot of people angry about it. I think because they loved the first one. So right. Much, and I loved the first one mm. and didn't bother playing the second one because uh, I'm lazy. But that means that I don't really mind that it's not. Illusion Softworks or mm. 2K Check so making the third one the fact, and that plus the fact that everyone who was there when the first one was made has long since left the mm. studio and formed other studios um, so I don't really mind it's been made by a, a, a new team <laughs> Interesting about the second one and the first one to an extent is that they created this whole open city and it was barely used at all and it was basically um, as people say a stage for the action to happen mm. on which is, reminds me as well of L.A. Noir yeah. and I, personally, I, a lot of people disagree with this, but I think that's a mistake for both, <laughs> because like the, the amount of resources that have to go into creating an entire city mm-hmm. with yeah. weather effects and lighting effects, and then and you just got a very funding. expensive loading screen. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> yeah. And that's what it felt like, especially in L.A. Noir, mm. when um, you, you, there were incidental mysteries that you could stumble across, sort of, um, but most of it was actually quite boring, driving down streets and it like. Didn't add a huge. Yeah. For, if you ever listen to this, you know, you know, Little Richard on the radio while you're doing it. That's the, the, quite the, good. They'd nailed a kind of Chinatown lighting as well, so mm-hmm. that this kind of LA light they had in it was was quite nice, and that kind of fed into it. But they could have done that just by walking down a street, spawning you at the, the start of a street and making you walking down it before you go into the mission area, not having an entire functioning city with pathfinding for cars and stuff. Um, mm-hmm. And I wonder if they'll. I mean. Uh, it, it, open worlds are almost expected now because they're, they're just everywhere. And but open worlds are amazing now, and mm-hmm. they're created by huge studios with huge budgets. Mm. And I think going with that for Mafia Three without that level of resource behind it would probably be a mistake. Mm. The tricky thing about the Mafia games, though, is that they're normally set over quite large t- periods of history, mm. and so it was really impressive in Mafia Two, although the city wasn't used that much. I think it was set during three different. Hmm. Time it starts out just after World War Two ends. I think it ends in the nineteen seventies. Does it go as late as that? Well, it might be late sixties. I think mm. so. yeah, that's what I thought. But e- either way, it's that it's, um, they update the city as they go mm. along. They update the cars. They ob- update storefronts. They're uh, um, the kind of vignettes you play in those time periods are at different times of year. So you play that city in mm. the snow, mm. and then you play that city in the summer, and that sort of stuff. And it's that would be much harder to do, I think, if yeah. you were not just creating that open world city as a stage but as an actual place in mm. the GTA sense of it um, from the there's a little like teaser image that they've put out that people are squinting at the cars in the shadows and wondering if it's, it's going to be set in the 70s whether mm. it will move the well, there's a lady with a big afro that you can see silhouetted by some car headlights which would suggest is there? I didn't notice the afro era. yeah I wonder if they'll move from I mean obviously all the mafia of games so far have riffed heavily on it's Mafia happening. Cinema mm. and so I wonder if they'll do something that's more Goodfellas rather than mm. Godfather Yeah, it was interesting the uh, the video I'm doing at the moment I was um, looking at the baptism scene from The Godfather Part 1 uh, as part of an 
idea about how games never really use cinematic techniques to their full extent. They often use like the framing devices, cinematic techniques, you know, pointing a camera and angling it, uh, often to the detriment of actually being able to interact with the game, like in cutscenes and stuff, or things where your focus is grabbed and taken. But they never use cutting, really, apart mm. from in 30 Flights of Loving, yeah. mm. and it's really, really rare to see that. But the baptism scene, which is like a, the climactic montage of that film, is when Michael Corleone is, uh, you know, back, having his child baptised, and it's, you know, the Catholic minister is saying, do you renounce Satan? And he's going, yes, I do. And it cuts back and forth between, you know, his henchmen gunning down all these <laughs> other opposing bosses in horrible ways. And I was thinking, well, that's maybe actually one of the reasons I never really liked Mafia 2. Like, it felt... I don't think those games really understand exactly what they're appropriating. Or at least the second game didn't. I really liked the first one, but the second game felt a bit uh, bland and trite in all its attempts to kind of capture those films. And, you know, you'd have... It's it's hard thing to do, because you have maybe uh, 20 seconds to set up a mission and also give some kind of character notes. But it just ends up, you know, oh, it's the fat, bumbly one, and he's got a prostitute on his lap, and let's go and kill some people, hey! <laughs> uh, <laughs> like mm, that doesn't doesn't quite manage to match the 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 pace or the tone or even the kind of drama that happens in those films. Mm. So I obviously been wanting yeah. to say that for a while. And <laughs> I definitely agree about cuts. I'd like to see them yeah. so much more. But apart mm. from anything, even apart from like the cinematic effect, just get to the fucking point. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> just get on with it. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Oh, on a slightly related note. Uh, I also hate walkthroughs in games. Hate what? Sorry? Uh, walkthroughs. So uh, a period of time when you're forced to walk down. Oh god, yeah, like the intro to Home Human Revolution. Yes, yeah, which they like seem quite proud of in the director's commentary. But I just want to say that that's the antithesis of what Deus Ex is. Yeah. It's like taking all the control away and just kind of showing you things. Yeah, no, it's a real uh, fumble that that opening sequence. Yes, because they make yeah. you shoot a whole bunch of people and take away all the control. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and uh, the rest of the game is fantastic, but uh, that's a. Uh, so, you saw the E3 videos they put out for Mankind Divided, right? Where yeah. it's a very similar walkthrough. There is a walkthrough, yeah. You're having a banter with a woman while walking through a train That's station, and it doesn't look, based on the animations, like you can control your legs. Mm. It seems like you can just yeah. angle your head a little yeah. bit. That's where it I'm willing to forgive that up to a point based on the, the quality of the narrative that's being set up. Mm. Like, uh, and I also think it's they're all partly in... They're all kind of partly in hoc to... Uh, Half Life's tram sequence. Yeah. Everybody wants to have a Half Life tram sequence. <laughs> so, I hated that. So long. <laughs> <laughs> really? That's the only person like on that tram sequence. Like, oh, for fuck's sake, come on, let it, me play. It, it mm. does go on a bit long, I think. Yeah. Yeah, but if I'm playing a person with a bionic body, I'm. I don't want to be a tram. Like, at least I understand the context <laughs> of being a tram. Um, it, the, Unless I specifically choose that upgrade. <laughs> ha- having all the tram restrictions, but being also a person who could potentially walk around <laughs> anywhere, like, that's just even worse. Yeah. <laughs> It's just an unskippable cutscene, but they because they don't think of it as a cutscene, they let it go on for like ten it's minutes. Ages, yeah. Mm. Mm. Yeah. For the just for the video I'm doing, I was doing it on Tomb Raider, and I've played it again mm. when it when it, I played it when it first came out, and quite I, I quite liked it really. Um, I'm playing a second time, not just because Chris is relentlessly hating on that game <laughs> whenever there's an opportunity to do so, and has poisoned my mind, but. Uh, it's really notable how little to no interaction there is yeah. in the first two, three hours of that game. Like, it is astonishing. Like, you'll just, you'll walk a few paces and then the, you'll be, well, no, control taken away, another cutscene for you. And then even when there is control, you're literally, there's like so many moments when you're doing nothing but pressing forward. Yeah. And then, you know, Occasionally hitting X to stop Lara having her neck poked through with a big <laughs> stick or something like that, when which they, I always miss because I'm so fucking bored by that point. <laughs> when they um, uh, let me play it to preview uh, the first bit, I think it's the first bit in the game, but certainly the first bit of the, the build I played. Uh, you're on a cliffside and uh, it's stormy, and the first challenge of any kind, the first obstacle Lara encounters is like a slippery log across a chasm, and she has to walk on it. And you get on it, it makes a big deal, like, oh, slippery it is, and she's walking oh, yeah. side to side. <laughs> so I walked halfway on and then just like held right, can't fall off. No, Impossible no, to fall off. You can't no go way. backwards. You can only, <laughs> only go one way on it. <laughs> yeah, I was yeah. watching the demo at um, E3 this year, and it looked like exactly the same sort of stuff. Um, just, just beat for beat, just falling down things but uh, you know there's clearly no way well, back from each other. My, my thesis for this video is that the 
that game kind of game is dead now mm. and should and so. should rightfully die. And <laughs> because you saw all the other games at E3, mm. they were all, you know all the games that would previously have been cinematic shooters mm. in the same franchises that have actually included cinematic shooters in the past are now open world systemic games. Yeah, and you know like things like Tomb Raider Uncharted look like fucking dinosaurs. Even and Halo too. Is, is, well. is Splinter Cell the new? I hope have we seen anything called? on the news no, uh, Is it what's the the open what's it? Oh, Ghost Recon. Yeah. Yes. Don't get those two sorry, <laughs> stupid, how are franchises mixed up. How dare you? I know how much you love this so much. <laughs> uh, but yeah, open world Ghost I'll make Recon. you kiss my Tom Clancy tattoo. Well, we'll, we'll talk about that later. Uh, yes, th- th- like that is for, for that franchise to go into a big open world would be about like defeating drug runners mm. in an open world environment with all these tools is fucking awesome and then yeah you see Tomb Raider do, do you think that that also applies to Uncharted 4 then? Uh, well I kind of think Uncharted gets a bit of a free pass uh, at least for this final instalment mm. uh, because it has been the best of mm. all of those games like the roller coaster like, games basically but partly because it has such a compelling uh, com- oh I said compelling sorry uh, partly because it has really great characters uh, who you care about and it's mm. quite funny and witty and charming and you know uh, yeah, if you're going to make a movie, at least it's a good movie. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Whereas yeah. you can't really say that for Tomb Raider, can you? Because uh, they, they, they did make a game. There is always some shooting, and there is a. Uh... Yeah, no, that's that's what's so strange about it. I yeah. think it's a game that recognises the point at which it has become obsolete. <laughs> like it, because it, it has things in it that mm. seem like they're going to try for the systemic stuff. So it has these open world kind of Metroidvania environments that you really don't get any particular reason to explore. Mm. Um, and it has like an upgrade system, which is really so limited that you never really have that much choice over which direction you take mm. her upgrades in. But, you know, it's, it's got those things in it. It's almost like it's recognising, fuck, we, we need some of that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> which is it's just Uncharted. No, it's Tomb Raider. We're talking oh, about the okay. Tomb Raider reboot now. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Very pretty, though. It was very like pretty. pictures of environments. Then, uh, yeah. yeah, I think some people do just want to play through a yeah. story. and. Mm. That's it. <laughs> 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 uh, I like Bulletstorm as a kind of in between where it is just a mm. uh, fairly old fashioned, just linear arena thing. You go from one room to the next and you get a number of ridiculous tools with which to destroy the enemies. But also the spectacle you get is just fantastic. Like you, the the on rails kind of turret sequence is you're on the back of a giant vehicle being chased by a colossal death wheel full of spikes that is the size of a skyscraper. <laughs> yeah. And uh, yeah, it just does all, all the things that roller coaster games do. but does it up to <laughs> the, the wheel kind of veers off at one point and you're like oh thank god for that <laughs> yeah. and then somehow and probably it sort of yeah, comes back, back onto the course again it's like what come on and your guy goes oh shit <laughs> <laughs> the wheel's it's back real. that's why I always liked uh, although it does go off the rails or on the rails towards the end uh, the f- original crisis because <laughs> it had uh, it's going it, completely off the rails and by that I mean on the rails <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, because it had that sense of big open combat bubbles where you could approach them from far away and mm-hmm. use your suit powers to stealth it or mm-hmm. go all out or use vehicles or flank and so forth and so on but it also had those scripted sequences where you were fighting an yeah. enormous spaceship that yeah. you know was was the size of a frigate or a mountain was crumbling apart in the distance to reveal a spaceship mm-hmm. that was inside it or half the island was getting encased in ice all mm. of a sudden or an atomic <laughs> blast was going off on the island rocking you and about two dozen other military <coughs> ships off the coast yeah, um, that's pretty cool yeah. all, all these sequences were fucking great um, and then in Crisis 2 it turned into a series of linear small arenas with absolutely none of the spectacle until towards the end mm, of yeah. uh, the previous game which is a shame what bullshit anyway what have you guys been playing <laughs> that isn't bullshit I've been playing Endless Legend. Wow. Um, what way do you pick that up again? Um, it was reading about one of the factions. I think one of the they've added some factions or something, and there was a trailer for one of them, and it just reminded me how fucking great the factions in that game are. Just how good the the I'm not really sure what the exact word for it is, but I want to say fiction, and by that I don't mean plot or story or anything. I don't really know what mm. the story is. Right, it's, just, a, it's a 4X game, right? Yeah. That's the one I'm thinking of, because yeah. there have been quite a lot of Legend games, I've forgotten. And quite a lot of Endless games as well, this yeah. Yeah. Endless Space and so, stuff. And, um, the kind of conception of each race is really unique and separate. Yeah, exactly. Uh, the design of them is so good. And actually, I think the final straw was... Oh yeah, I remember, it was two things. So it was that trailer that came up, and then I'd also... I don't remember how I arrived at it, but I, was, I arrived at the wiki page for one of the other races that I knew about and hadn't played as before. 
And I read the description and just thought, this is fucking amazing. <laughs> <laughs> and they're called the Cult of the Endless something? Or Cult of the Eternal End? And they just write off them like a first sentence of description of this. You know, this is just something like properly different because it says they are, they're a culture defined by um, two entities, a queen who may or may not be dead <laughs> and a roaming like nomad leader guy who may or may not be serving her <laughs> and it's just like immediately like just having two things <laughs> already you're ahead of like 90 percent of fi- like faction backstories there are two things going on here and then the design of them is just fucking mad like the main hero guy is sort of dressed in like um robes and stuff but his actual you don't see any skin and his arms just seem to be like sort of like carved out of bone or something and then his has this enormously long neck and his head is just a like like a sort of statue head like chiselled out like a sort of like almost like an easter island head um where there's no actual eyes or mouth or nose or anything just kind of the vague semblance of those features and just pretty really blank and weird and then you look at the other units and they're like that but with three faces on the head or the basic unit you have is called um a preacher i think and it's a giant like Studio Ghibli style mech type thing, sort of an automaton, maybe made out of stone rather than metal, um, trudging ahead and dragging behind it a just completely uh, uniform stone cube, or like a marble cube, like almost as big as it, just a massive block of marble, and a cultist just sitting on it <laughs> with reins onto the mech. <laughs> That's their basic unit. <laughs> And what it does is, I think it can fight. I never actually used one in a fight. Well, maybe I did, but I didn't watch the fight because you can auto resolve. Um, and their whole concept is that they're actually just a, um, primarily a religion or a sort of, well, they're a cult. Um, and they can't, they start with one city and they can't build any new cities. They can never have a settler. They can never expand from their original territory. All they can do is build out that one city and it's like their mecca. Um, and then they go out into the world and, they can't convert the enemy factions, but they can convert the minor factions who are just littered around the world. Yeah. And there's, um, in every, like, I'm playing on tiny maps and there are about 15, uh, regions. And each region will have, you can have one city per region. And each region has like three little villages of minor factions. And everyone encounters those things. And almost always you want to, uh, they'll give you little quests and you do a quest for them and then they're pacified and they yeah. lend you their units and stuff. And, um, these guys can convert them. So they pacify them and then they just, like, spend some of their influence to just turn them to their side and they get all the benefits. And it's like having a little mini city, but you can't control it. And it just produces one unit every six turns or whatever, uh, forever for free. But you can't tell it what to build and those units kind of go out of date and you can't ever conquer any other territory. So I had this bizarre game where, um, I, it actually worked out, but then afterwards I thought, how the hell do you play this race properly? <laughs> um, I was on an island. I'd set everything to random, but just a tiny map, one other opponent. And I was on an island with like three regions, and they were aligned with three regions. And so I, I just kind of conquered or, I don't know, <laughs> culturally indoctrinated all of the minor factions on my island and kind of owned them all. Um, and then I was able to research like sea technology and go across the sea and then start taking over the minor factions on his land but without declaring war so you can just kind of walk in and just take the mini cities that are all in in his territory and then you've got free units within his territory and it gets really weird because at one point we had a um a closed border treaty which means like we can't enter each other's territory but i have villages just automatically producing units in his territory anyway <laughs> just all the time and uh does that break the treaty automatically no i think they have to i think it only counts if they enter but I don't know. Um, I think I feel like I saw a unit get bumped out once, but I don't think it was a like a uh, one of these generated units. I think it was one of my own ones. Um, so yeah, I, like uh, it worked fine, and I uh, basically I discovered that all I need to capture these villages is just influence, which is like political capital. And I discovered you can actually tell your people to produce that stuff, like in your city. You, you have like in Syria, you have a certain number of citizens, and you you decide what they work on. And you can just move them to influence, and they'll just be influential. <laughs> and then you spend that influence to recruit um, uh, villagers and stuff. And but afterwards, 
So have you ever played as them, Tom? Uh, no, I believe actually, the more you describe them, I believe they're actually, they were co-created by Amplitude and the community. Uh, oh. And it's one of the uh, things they laid out before, I think, even the game was released. And a lot of the concept art was kind of generated by the community, and a lot of, in fact, right. I think maybe the main concept about uh, the game being about these minor villages that might come from the community as well. Huh. So it's this really interesting kind of collaborative hmm. uh, collaboration between the community and the, the designers. The thing I'm wondering about is, on my map it worked out fine because the guy never crossed the sea, so he never colonised any of my land. Hmm. But, like, in terms of expansion space, it didn't matter that like, I didn't, couldn't conquer those territories because I was, you can expand your main city massively, they get a bonus, they can make more districts and hmm. they get all kinds of, um, it's really, really well defended no matter what. Um, but I was thinking, if, they, if he'd been on my island, then although I could keep taking those minor territories, I couldn't stop him from taking those territories. Like in all 4X games, um, the early game is always about, there's always a land grab, and it's who can get the territory first, and you're not at war. So if someone takes it before you, you're in this awkward situation where, well, I wanted that, but now is it worth declaring war over it? Or, mm. like, it's much better if you can just grab it peacefully. Um, and in this, you can't take anything. <laughs> you just you can take those little villages, but they're not that good. And you just have to watch everyone else take all the land around you. Like on my game, those three factions, three territories next to me, never got taken by anyone. They were just empty. Mm. But in, in a game, with, <coughs> excuse me, in a game that wasn't on easy and wasn't on tiny map and wasn't have, just have one other faction, um, I'm sure all the territories would go. So you'd be surrounded by enemies always. But I think the victory conditions are some of them are divorced from. Just owning territory, aren't they? So uh, yeah, that might be where they can take. An yeah, advantage. they're quite weird. So uh, last time I talked about Ender's Legend, I had the same opinion of the fiction. Was really excited by all the factions and um, really uh, interested in trying them all out. But um, I found it quite hard to read, like just to tell what's going on. I still have that problem a little bit, but it's mostly just a kind of brute force thing of you just got to play it for a whole bunch of hours and then mm. you know uh, how things work. There's stuff like if you <clears throat> if you're clicked on the wrong thing. The icons above all of you's heads disappear. So on the map, there's all these, there's, you know, thousand different icons for things, but it's taken away the icon that tells you where your troops are. <laughs> and if you want to, like, all the time, you need to be thinking about what the value of different tiles are. Like, um, uh, if you're playing as a race that can expand, then you really need to know, is that a good territory to expand to? How much food do I get if I settle there? How much, whatever. And that's represented by between, like, two and four icons on every hex of the entire grid and you can turn it on or off at will but you just kind of need it there and when it's there there's literally a thousand icons on screen right? it's just a field of icons and then they indicate uh, there's these treasure locations that you send your hero to or anyone to to pick up they're like goody huts they're normally called in um, 4x games and basically whoever gets them first will get like a little bit of gold or a cool quest mm. item or something and those are indicated by glowing gold shafts coming out of them and that's also the sign for a luxury resource that does virtually nothing and isn't important, a strategic resource which is vital <laughs> but you can't pick it up or anything and uh, a quest of any kind on any other tile so gold light just means fucking anything, could be anything. So I keep having to zoom out, if you zoom out far enough it goes into like paper map mode with icons on it and those icons are actually useful and uh, it's quite clear what's going on but it takes away all of the beauty of it's like a really gorgeous game it does like tilt shift stuff when you zoom in like everything's really lush and verdant um, but I have to zoom out to the map mode to do that but then if you zoom too far into the map mode it hides all the icons again yeah. <laughs> so you've got to find this tiny little sweet spot between the chaotic 3D view and the completely blank map <laughs> <laughs> But uh, I'm enjoying it loads more now because I just understand it better. Um, and uh, I'm now in the middle of a game that I'm properly having fun with. Like that, that cultist game was just kind of, I was just really curious about how the hell does this work? How do you play like this? Um, and it was interesting, but it wasn't that good a game because um, I, you know, we never really fought that much <laughs> and then I just won. And this game is also going to be very easy because I played on the same difficulty, but I wanted to try a different race. And so now I'm trying the peace lizards. <laughs> they're called the Drakan, but um, they're, they're lizard men, and their race concept is that they just don't want to fight. They just want to unite everybody, and mm. they're more interested in like learning stuff and um, and yeah, just bringing everyone together. And so I'm playing with one other per person, and I've set everything to random. So it's, it's tiny, um, and one other person, and easy, but everything else is random. So ge geography, um, uh, which race I'm fighting against, and one of the perks of this race is because they know everything, they're very knowledgeable, um, they know where all the enemy 
factions start. So as soon as the game starts, you know, you can see where the enemy is and who they are. And it had pitted me against the peace lizards. <laughs> <laughs> so this game is just two factions of peaceful, <laughs> loving lizards who just want to make peace. <laughs> and it's like, okay, well, this, I think that's good news. <laughs> I mean, it seems like there won't be a war soon. <laughs> but then if I make peace with him, isn't that his victory too? <laughs> like, how do I, I want to, I want to win, and I want to just me win. I don't want him to win also. <laughs> That's not the kind of alliance victory I want. I want the kind of peaceful alliance victory where only I have won and everyone else has lost. <laughs> and so uh, the first time I actually, like, you have to research the ability to make peace. Um, like, by default, your state is Cold War. Actually, the way the game handles aggression is really interesting. So Cold War means that if you... Uh, if you meet in territory that neither of you owns, you can kill each other, and it's not a declaration of war, it's just like, that's just how things are. Hmm. But if you, I think if you go into, <clears throat> you go into the enemy territory and then you attack them, I think that counts as a declaration of war. Uh, but once you've researched the ability to make peace, then you can have proper peace where you actually say, like, you, we won't attack each other at all. And I got to that point where I unlocked that technology and talked to the peace lizard and said, Hi, peace lizard. I'm peace lizard here. Um, <laughs> should we make peace, that thing that we do and we desperately want? And he said, Yeah, if you give me about 150 gold. <laughs> what? Hang on. <laughs> Are you really peace lizards? Like, my faction, that's all we're about. We just want to make peace. That's our only objective. And I'm the only other person in the world. <laughs> so if you don't want to make peace with me, I don't know how that fits into your peace-loving objectives. <laughs> Um, Maybe he's a greedy piece of leather. <laughs> well, so he, I couldn't really blame him because I was I wanted to make peace so that he wouldn't attack me, um, so that I could steal all the land all around him, <laughs> and kind of own the whole map. And I looked up how di- how yeah it's called a diplomacy victory. Uh, I looked up how it works. And it's like you do so in uh, Galsiv. I think an alliance victory is you actually forge an alliance with everyone, and then everyone's in an alliance, and you'll win, and it's great. Um, or you've already formed an alliance, and you kill the remaining people, or you know whatever. Um, just so long as you end up with all of you in an alliance. And here, it doesn't seem to matter whether you're in an alliance or not, or whether you're at peace or anything. It's just that all of those actions, making peace, uh, treaties, and uh, forming alliances, get you diplomacy points. And all of the time you spend at peace and all the time you spend in alliances get you more diplomacy points. And so when it's just you and one other person and they're both trying to make peace, like, it meant that both of us being at peace was getting us both points at the same rate. <laughs> but the fact that I offered peace in the first place got me like a tiny, tiny <laughs> lead. <laughs> so just very slightly ahead of him. <laughs> and so both of our, you can see it on a graph, like both of our diplomacy points are just racing up at the exact same rate, but I'm like two points ahead because <laughs> I, I made the first move. <laughs> So I'm like two percent more peaceful than you, asshole. So I'm gonna win this shit. <laughs> and so um, I was. Uh, I've just been churning out settlers, and I'm doing like it's basically become a microcosm of uh, the most tense and exciting and critical part of any 4x game, which is that land grab. We talk about the peaceful land grab where you can't attack each other, and so it's whoever gets the land first kind of wins. And I'm just going mad with settlers and just all I ever build is settlers. And if I do anything else, it's to raise enough money so that instead of building a settler, I can afford to buy a settler outright. And I'm doing like settler leapfrogging where, because the territory takes a long time to cross, I send a settler to a territory, they make a town, and then everyone else stops what they're doing and spends all, all of that term producing money instead of anything else. And then uh, you can't make a settler right away, but next turn you can start one. And then as soon as you start one, you have the option to buy it out. And that doesn't get you at that turn, it gets you at next turn. But if I can have enough, if I can have 600 gold ra- raised by that point, then I can buy out the settler. And so in like a three-turn turnaround, I can have a new settler come from the new village and walk straight to the neighbouring village and settle there, and then just keep looping that way. <laughs> and I've, I've done that, daisy-chaining settlements and cities around him. Um, to the point where he has three territories in the middle and I've encircled him completely. And then I declared closed borders, so he's not allowed to cross into my territory, <laughs> which means he can't get to any other territories ever. <laughs> he's just completely encircled. <laughs> and that's my um, peaceful tactic. <laughs> <laughs> I think Ender's Legion is the best thing to happen to Fork Genre since Gal Civ 2. Um, mm. Like Civ 3, 4, or 5 are really aw- awesome games, and they... Um, they vary things a lot within the Civ formula, but I think they, like Total War and a lot of other, especially strategy games, um, Civ is kind of beholden to its audience in a way that means it can never be as crazy and experimental and 
exciting as Endless Legend is. Yeah. And Endless Legend, not only with its kind of diverse faction design, but also in the way it kind of structures its tech trees and into a web, which was since then immediately adopted by Civilization Beyond Earth, and the way it kind of the whole having one city per territory and just loads of other just really good streamlining things. That yeah, it's like. definitely got loads of streamlining that, that really works. The way that that citizens work and the way you can distribute them like that and how they rate the population, it's pretty close to Civ, but it just kind of clicks in a way mm. that Civ never does. Civ looks so messy when you actually go to manage a city, mm. plugging these icons into the different sockets and stuff and then figuring out, well, that socket doesn't count for some reason or this one has some exception to it. And this city should be making loads of this resource, but because I'm distributing citizens is right, it's not. Mm. And one thing, I don't know if this is actually true, but the way it feels in Endless Legend is like all of your population and city size is all good. Like it's always, you've got some good territory, it's doing some good always. And adding citizens to something is just a sort of extra bonus on top of it. Whereas Civ, it's like, if you're not plugging those citizens into those tiles, those tiles are useless. They're just wasting mm. away. And you're always doing something wrong in Civ. Whereas Endless Legend, it feels like just, which, like on top of all the baseline good stuff that you're getting, because well done, you conquered that, you settled that city and you expanded it and you conquered it, um, conquered the right territory. Um, you know, what else do you want to focus on on top of that? And that's great. Whereas Galsiv is the other end to Civ where it's, well, I guess it's just even further in that direction where it's, you can completely crash your economy. <laughs> Everything's in brink of destruction or rebellion at all times. And, uh, it's tough to manage. But yeah, it's interesting you say about the uh, sort of the, the crazy stuff in Galsiv. Because actually, I played Galsiv 3, um, a few games of it. And I was trying to figure out whether I wanted to do a diary about it because um, uh, I would if I thought it would go as well as the... If I thought the game itself would be as interesting as um, last time I played. And I think Galsiv 3 is good and I think it's very faithful to Galsiv 2 and it doesn't leave me thinking like they fucked it up or anything. But I also didn't feel like... I wanted an idea for something cool to do, like a, to set out and do something interesting. Like my objective is do this crazy thing. And there's only one crazy thing. I looked through the little tech trees, I looked through all the, um, uh, I forget what it's called, but you sort of pick an alignment and you get alignment points and you can spend those on things. And they sound good. There, there are things like, if you go evil, then you can spend those points making your people so terrified of you, their work and hazardous conditions and things like that. But the best one is the one I talked about before um, on the podcast where I had a game where I just, uh, there's one cultural ability where if you're influential enough, you can flip every planet within your influence. So if you just focus on making all of your influence big enough and then get enough points to have, unlock that ability, then if you time it right, you can flip all those planets. And that's crazy and awesome and weird. <laughs> and it, it becomes a play style unto itself. And I wanted more stuff like that. And I looked through Tech Tree and there's just nothing else like that. And then they patched out the ability to generate those points. So you still get them if you settle a new planet that you get some choices that um, one of those choices gets you a certain amount of points. But once you run out of planets, I don't know if there's any way to get them at all. Mm. And previously you could just build buildings that generated them and they took that out, so now you can't do that. So basically that tactic that was fun last time is gone now. And there's nothing else like that. Whereas Galsiv 2, admittedly this is after a bunch of expansions and stuff, um, They when they introduced like individual tech trees for each race, the one race was like an isolationist race and they didn't like anyone else. And they had, um, instead of like their troop tech for like invading a planet and landing your troops on it and taking it over. They just had a spore weapon and it was like a boarding, sorry, not boarding, um, invasion event. But instead of actually like playing the little invasion mini game and seeing whether your troops are better than there, you automatically win and it kills everyone on the planet. <laughs> it just murders <laughs> every single last living thing on the planet and makes it toxic. <laughs> and so if you have the right tech, I think you can salvage the planet and it will just be a shitty irradiated <laughs> hellhole for the rest of time. But that's it. That's just what they do with the fact that they just go around and just massacre every single last person <laughs> and then try and make a home on the shitty ruined world they've made. <laughs> that's awesome. That's so, got so much personality to it. It's a new game mechanic and it's just... It's very human. Yeah. Ways. If I wanted to, if made that my objective, I'm just going to murder everyone in the galaxy. Literally every last person who exists. <laughs> that would be a great concept for like a cool playthrough. And Ender's Legend is obviously full of that. Like every race yeah. is one of those things that they have a concept where like we're going to conquer the world this weird way. You should do an endless legend diary. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I can't wait to see what Aptitude make next. What their strategy team makes next. Mm. Exciting. I discovered that there's, um, the first time I played, I played as, uh, the Mezari, who are like, uh, again, the, the 
concept art and stuff that they show you for them is just fantastic. And they're like, um, in this, they're very carefully judged to look just between medieval armor and space marine armor. And, um, their story is that they've just, they're, they are from a spaceship and they just landed and they, they're here. And I think all their, their ship is broken down and they can't get away. And so they're just kind of making the best of what they have with the primitive local tech. And there's another faction called the Volters, who at first I thought were totally separate. And I read the description and it was the first time I thought, well, that faction sounds a bit nothing. I don't really get what their concept is. And they are from, uh, they know little of their own history and they just, just that they came from a, a metal underground dwelling. And then I realized it's the people that you were telling me about, Graham, who are like the inhabitants of a spaceship who crashed there mm. like thousands of years ago and they've lost all, all knowledge of their old sci-fi ways and so they've become medieval and they're actually the same faction uh, like all the tech trees are the same everything about them is the same but one of them knows their space people and the other one doesn't <laughs> <laughs> and I think both of them might have come from Endless Dungeon which is their Dungeon of the Endless Dungeon of the Endless <laughs> Dungeon of the Endless is set inside the spaceship that's crash landed on the planet <laughs> Yeah, in shit. Endless Legend. <laughs> um, and it's a faction which, if it's not playable, it's heavily referenced in Endless Space, which mm. was the first game they did. Ah, so there's like a mythical race, I think, in Endless Space, and mm. it's them. They crash landed on this ah. planet. And you can... So neat. I like that. Yeah. I like that kind of cross-game. Daisy chain. Yeah, love it. Yeah, lovely. Sweet Daisy chain. then. <laughs> what have you been playing, Tom Senior? I've been playing The Swindle. Yeah. Which everyone really, really likes except me. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the Swindle is a um, size five games that made uh, basically it's a platform game uh, in which you are a thief trying to rob money from procedurally generated properties, and you have one hundred robberies to gain enough money to get to the highest tier of property and dismantle or steal um, this thing. Uh, a, a government device that will end the profession of thievery forever <laughs> by be, being able to see everyone. Oh, okay. <laughs> I think it's called the Basilisk. It's a kind of machine thing. Um, the thing Batman doesn't use in Batman Begins. It, yeah, it's giant. Yeah, it's giant. <laughs> or is it the Dark Knight? Uh, the, the Dark, the Dark Knight. Knight, yeah. He does use it, though. He just uses it once and then turns it off. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's <laughs> enough, it's too dangerous to use, except for that time he uses it. And then Ben from Lost gets it and makes a TV show about it. Yeah, <laughs> Person of Interest. Yeah, which is created by the guy oh, who yeah. wrote The Dark Knight. Is it uh, really? No way. That yeah, it's Jonathan sense. Nolan, huh. who created that. that show. <laughs> that's hilarious. Um, and better than The Swindle, probably. <laughs> <laughs> which, uh, <Two> facts. <laughs> um, it's a really cool idea for a game. And it looks really nice. And you've got these lovely kind of procedurally generated thieves. And you can, uh, when you go into a property, all the properties are full of robot guards. And all the properties are also full of spike pits. <laughs> um, and they're also full of computer terminals. And there is also cash just lying on the floor <laughs> around the place. Hmm. And it's one of, like, it makes... No sense. <laughs> like the, the entire setup of like you're supposed to be. It gives you the address of the place, which is like nine nine seven London Road, London or something. <laughs> and it almost implies that it's supposed to be like a just a residence <laughs> where someone might live. Um, but you go in there, and there, there are these, these robot guards, and you're platforming around them, and they've all got their kind of sight rectangles, and the majority of the guards just move back and forth until they hit a collision, and then kind of let their reverse direction hit another collision. So they're all just going back and forth between a door and the edge of a spike pit endlessly. And it's your job to kind of jump around them and then get to a terminal and hack it with like a, with a quick time event. So you have to press left and then up and then down and then right. And then you'll get a load of money. Then you have to escape back to your pod and, and flee. And the idea is that you gain enough money over the course of uh, 100 robberies to upgrade your thief, uh, make them better, buy passes to higher tiers of properties that are harder and full of more and more enemies until you actually get to the, the last level um, but for me it had like a load of problems uh, one of them being the fact that your thief is completely ill-equipped to deal with the levels that are generated for you for a long time um, the double jump for example is just an essential upgrade and it costs not very much in the grand scheme of the game it costs like $500 but Large amounts of levels will just be completely locked off to you if you don't have it. Isn't it pounds? 
Oh, is it pounds? I remember noticing that it was pounds sterling, ah. which is nice. <laughs> <laughs> that is nice. By locked off, do you mean you play, you roll a new level and you just can't go? That's right, yeah. They'll they, be stretched to the level that, unless you have certain upgrades, what you won't be able to get to. Right. And in fact, uh, one of the biggest problems with the game is just level generation and the way it generates stuff. And it's clearly inspired by Splunky, and um, it's like a really cool idea. And if the level generation was better, I think it would, it would work a lot, lot better. But when it's limiting the number of attempts you have to complete the game, um, if it screws up a game, like if you can't possibly get uh, half the stuff in that level because of the quirk of level generation, then that's a serious problem with what it's asking mm. you to do. Because <laughs> it's not my fault that this particular terminal, the terminals are the, are the things that you really, really need. They've got all the money, uh, and if it, uh, like it doesn't matter if you pick up every piece of cash off the floor, like it's not going to be anywhere near as much as just hacking a terminal. And I've just got loads of screenshots in my folders of terminals I could never get to. <laughs> That uh, just uh, inside that, uh, like, with no connecting corridors, just <laughs> floating in, mm -hmm. uh, just surrounded, completely surrounded by walls. And there are mines in the game and uh, bombs that you can unlock by paying a lot of money. You have to gather loads of money first before you can unlock the ability to use mines uh, to plant dynamite, for example. Uh, but I'm still, I got loads of creatures in places where there was no place to possibly plant the dynamite in order to get to this terminal because it was. You have to have a space of flat ground to plant the dynamite and wait for it to go off. And if it's um, surrounded on both sides by two drops, then you have to go in from the top, and it would take like five dynamites to get down from the top into that. So there are just level generation errors. Like that is just that is not a good thing to happen in the context of this game and mm -hmm. the, the challenge it set you. Um, and that extends to it will give you a big long drop down into a room that's absolutely round full of enemies and spike traps with absolutely no rewards in it. But in order to actually just look down, you have to buy a £10,000 <laughs> just to look down or look up, uh, which is also seems like a vital thing that you should just be able to do. Uh, and it just it makes absolutely no sense that he... Why can't this character just look down with, with his... <laughs> with a, his what is the upgrade? Eyes. What's it called? Uh, I, I, I can't remember what it's called. Bionic Eyes. Uh, that's what it's, it's called, Bionic <laughs> Eyes. You, you can't look down at or awaiting him unless he has job Bionic Eyes. Um, and there's just loads and loads of stuff like that. You can't hack... Uh, so locked doors, you have to hack locked doors. You can't hack locked doors at all unless you've bought the hack locked doors upgrade. And that, unless you have it immediately, like you go to the second tier of levels, and that immediately locks off just half level <laughs> if you don't have it. And... That's it's just full of bullshit. That's just, <laughs> that's just bullshit. <laughs> it's just uh, it's just bullshit. Uh, yeah, they're, they're, <laughs> basically, the, your guy is supposed to be a professional thief, and there should there are things that he should just be able to do, mm. especially if the levels are demanding it. Uh, you know, if the levels are demanding that you should be able to double jump and hack stuff in, it feels like it should be a part of your basic skill set. And then uh, the upgrades you get beyond that let you tailor your playstyle, perhaps, and the way you take on enemies. But personally, I found like taking on enemies incredibly frustrating because um, the way it escalates difficulty is by it introduces some variety of enemies. So there are kind of flying cameras that will uh, they have their sight cones will kind of um, arc around the level, and then you know the next version of that they'll have a machine gun. So if they spot you, it won't just alert the police; it'll they'll shoot you. Uh, but the problem is that it apps, the sizes of the rooms don't really change. The size of the levels don't change, but it just piles more and more and more enemies into them. The more of the like, the further you get through your hundred attempts, until there are like twelve to fifteen different guys in a room, and there are no interesting ways to deal with them because all they do is move back and forth on their set paths, and their sight cones are all completely overlapping with each other. So there's no way to even get down and kind of like hit each hit them. So you're kind of double jumping over them and perhaps just trying to get around them. And the entire thing for me was just incredibly fiddly and annoying, and wasn't had nothing to do with being a, a, a burglar or you know being involved in a heist there are a few little tricks you can do there are mines on the floor you can walk up to them slowly and hack them and then an enemy walks over them and they blow up and that's like a little hint of what the game might have been like if there were, <laughs> if there were more options like that and more I ways saw, of exploiting them I saw the launch trailer today and it did have a cool moment where uh, I don't know how he did it but he hacked a, an enemy guard so that it just ran up to the nearest guard and bonked him on the head with a truncheon <laughs> and that looked great animation wise <laughs> Yeah, that's pretty cool. But uh, past a certain point, like there needs to be less than ten people in the room <laughs> in order to be able to do that. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. Um, and that's like how it, it's the way it escalates, it, or the way it grows its difficulty towards the end is just just ruin the game for me completely. If that limited hundred day thing was just gone and it was just sort of have as many as you like, just keep going, hmm. um, uh, or maybe like you run out of agents or something, 
or like limit was different so that if you did come across a level where it was just oh I can't do this one and you could just leave again hmm. would that solve it for you? Um, no <laughs> but it's just because I just I found the, the, the basic platforming too frustrating anyway right. so for example um, it's, it's the kind of a block system and if there's a um, a gap two blocks high which is like a window and there's uh, you know sometimes you can jump and your agent will kind of scarper up and let you get onto the roof, and that's really, really useful because there are loads of gaps like that. But at some t- most of the time, you won't. <laughs> and it's really, I have no idea, it's just a control problem where so you, like, sometimes you'll do it, sometimes you won't. So you're just there jumping and jumping and jumping and jumping and jumping and trying to get up there because it's the best way around the level. And th- they're almost like, there almost just aren't a- enough ways around the level. So there'll be a lot of different paths that lead to dead ends that you'll then have to backtrack through and stuff. And it's just, I just found it really annoying. Um, and I think it's more to do with how punishing it is and how frustrating it is to fail. And that, that's this is the core thing for me, is that uh, roguelikes are amazing if failure can be funny or entertaining. And it can be occasionally in the swindle, but it's m- almost always just... Fuck this, <laughs> <laughs> and then auto four, and then get back to it later. Yeah, and it's, uh, I think, like anyone who's interested in the balance between frustration and success, it might just be me because people love it. Like it's been reviewed really well. well else. The one review I read was, I think, Digital Spy, and they raised the exact uh, point you make about the hundred day thing. They said that the structure mm-hmm. felt at odds with the game because the randomness of the levels. Uh, it sounded like for, for that reviewer it would have been fixed if the 100-day mm. thing was gone because he said that the... Um, uh, quite like the randomness of the levels and didn't mind if it was generated an impossible one, but the fact that that cost him one of his 100 opportunities meant that it was you know, critical and mm. it felt like the structure was fighting the, the game. I think the, what, this, what the level generation incentive advised me to do was just constantly regenerate levels uh, until those terminals were on the outside rooms <laughs> and were easily accessible. So that was, that's the way around it. And if you remove the, the 100 try limit then that is the way to play the game just to regenerate and regenerate right, and regenerate right. um, and it's it's just uh, for me a core problem with it that Spelunky's level generation is absolutely beautiful it's like a beautiful beautiful piece of design that you know that is the gold standard of 2D platform roguelike generation really um, and uh, the swindle is a brilliant example of what happens when the generation isn't good enough to support the roguelike thing because the frustration you get, <laughs> you get out of it is just like destroyed it for me. Mm. But, for, but a lot of people have said that they love it and that they didn't have any problem with it and they just wanted to keep playing it and playing it. Uh, so maybe I'm just a grumpy. Maybe they got better levels. Maybe, maybe they're <laughs> just, maybe they're better than me. But no, I mean like everyone who's played it's played it a load. Like I played it for like ten hours. And seen a lot of levels. <laughs> yeah, but an interesting, an interesting, problematic game. I think. Like mm. in terms of if you want to look at a game and try and figure out why those levels are wrong and why they yeah. kind of don't quite work. So it almost feels like it's uh, just a couple of fixes away from working, mm. the, the level generation specifically, um, which is really interesting. I do think that it just needs a great variety of variety of enemies and fewer enemies and more ways to mess with them. And it's possible that I've just, there are loads of ways that I haven't discovered yet. Um, but, yeah. I wonder why it's difficult to generate... To always generate a level that works, uh, that, where everything's connected at least, like disregarding difficulty and disregarding the overstuffing them with enemies and all that, um, just making sure that there is always a way to get from point A to point B for any given pair of point A and point B. Yeah. Like particularly with a reward, like a, re- a reward. I'm sure you could just do like a path. I suppose. Hmm. But, I think, so in heat signature, I'm it's top down, and so I can really easily pick any two points and just run up. Pathfinding check, like Game Maker has built in yeah. pathfinding. I just say, do the, is there a way to get point, point A, point B? And for a while, I'm not doing this at the moment, but um, uh, early on, I experimented with having, like, uh, when a ship was generated, I'd try locking a door, and then after I locked the door, checked, can you get from this side of the door to the other side of the door? And if if not, then uh, I would open the door again. <laughs> mm. <laughs> that was how the level generation worked. You never saw it, but secretly, it was just trying all these different configurations. Like, Does that work? No, it's impossible. Mm. I'm doing it. Um, and actually, you could use often so in, invisible ink, and uh, those guys have talked about how hard it was to get that level generated to work as well as it does. But um, it still generates stupid scenarios where, like, 
like half the time you find a locked door in that game, you can just walk around it. <laughs> it's like locked door next to an unlocked door, and they lead to the same room. <laughs> it's like, well, why the fuck is that one even locked? Then? And uh, for with his signature system, at least I could I could have run a check and said, okay, if that door doesn't stop you from getting to the other side of the door, then don't lock it because there's no point in locking it mm. because it doesn't make any sense. Also, it's useful to find when you have a, a top-down 2D environment or indeed an invisible link. Yeah. Whereas if there's yeah. suddenly gravity involved and yeah. you have to tell the, the system when they can't escape from a certain environment given gravity constraints, that's that must be fucking hard. <laughs> I was... Um, uh, I've, I've, like, the swindle in concept is so much like a game I would make. <laughs> like, procedural generation heist game is the thing I was yeah, working yeah, on at yeah. one point and I never got to the procedural generation part of it, but... Um, uh, I was gonna do it by just making the buildings incredibly boring. So like Gunpoint's buildings are incredibly boring. They're just a series of rectangles stacked on top of each other, mm. and you can always get to every part of one floor as long as I don't put a locked door in there um, for the sake of a puzzle. And then if I make sure you can go always get to the staircase, and all the staircases link to each other, then done, <laughs> you can get to anywhere on that level. But obviously, then you need something else to make the level interesting. And in Gunpoint, I could handcraft puzzles, but when you randomly generate it, I don't know how you make it interesting. Hmm, it doesn't feel like a heist game, the swindle. That's mm. another thing that it's it's because of the the spike pits and the robots and the, <laughs> yeah, I can see, I can see that. the lumps of cash sitting on the floor. Um, uh, <laughs> Didn't car production level. Yeah. Yeah, it would be great if they just walked in and said, Oh yeah. I got my grand on there. And just let, left. Just left. <laughs> There's a computer embedded in the wall that we can't get to, but yeah, yeah, don't worry. <laughs> yeah, I'm definitely gonna play it. Mm. It's an interesting game. I also played a game that had, uh, made me have a little tantrum. Uh, <laughs> I, think I was playing Feist, which I think you've also played. Yes. Feist, not Heist. Um, <laughs> which is a terrible Heist game. I can't believe they <laughs> even used that name. So. Yeah, it's a 2D platformer set in some kind of forest, uh, in largely in silhouette with beautifully coloured backgrounds, and it, uh, it looks gorgeous. And uh, you play what appears to be a hairball, um, <laughs> which is predated upon by nearly every other form of life in this forest. And uh, what starts out to be kind of like a, um, a platform with physically traps in it, like Limbo, turns out to be um, quite a, a, a physics-y combat game I- I for the most part. So you'll kind of trundle rightwards throughout any level, and then you'll come across creatures who have certain movement sets and certain attack patterns, and they'll just mob you, and you'll have to use physics to pick up objects and thwack them with them, or uh, you, you can uh, knock a knock a, one of these fly things out of the air, then pick it up and kind of palpate it to kind of make it fart out stingers. And <laughs> um, that wow. looks um, like the most bizarre series of words. <laughs> uh, and you're kind of the the major enemy that you seem to be seem to be your nemesis in this. So these kind of big things that look like um, things out of uh, where the wild things are. These big um, gruffalo type things, um, and they they they'll just. F- Fuck you up! Uh, when they get close to you. They they grab you, they throw you, and then they pummel you. They can teleport short distances. Um, and, Fucked up by the uh, Gruffalo, Marsh Davis story. Yes, not not going to be released by any children's publisher soon. Um, and uh, you know, there's all these other kind of physics-enabled objects in the environment. So there are kind of rope traps you can trigger and uh, which drop things, and so you can kind of lure enemies into um, things which will fire spikes at them or just drop boulders on them and all these other kinds of stuff um, and uh, uh, it's kind of cool but also really fucking irritating <laughs> and hard as nails. Uh, I think I did scream fuck you physics <laughs> and I quit the game it's, it's, it's hard because although it's all physics enabled and you feel like you should have uh, a command of it you're, you're kind of your ability to command those physics is fairly limited. Like you can only, when you throw things, you can only fire them in it. You can't do any kind of say over the trajectory at which you fire stuff. Mm. Uh, and that makes it really annoying when uh, you, know, you know something's right in front of you and you just want to hit it, but it's that slightly above you or slightly too below you, and you're right. just like, oh well, I'm fucked now. Then I can't do anything. Yeah, that's where um, I'm fucked. <laughs> <in this game. laughs> I actually um, we've spoken about this before, but mm. I'm stuck on a puzzle, which it turns out from talking to you, I learned I was trying to solve the right way, and it just it happened to. S- it just looked like to me like it wasn't possible, mm. but I, kept, I guess I just wasn't pressing the buttons at exactly the right times. Yeah, but I'm yeah. stuck on one of those rope traps that's on a slightly elevated platform. And if I jump up, I trigger it, and these darts shoot down and kill me. Um, and I've got a pine cone, and I can try and throw the, pro- throw the pine cone at the rope trap uh, by jumping. And then you can only throw it horizontally, seemingly. Mm. Um, so I have to jump up and then throw it horizontally. 
but my jump doesn't seem to be quite high enough to throw it unless I'm right on the edge, in which case I'm in the rope trap and then <laughs> I, get, yes. I get fucked by the rope trap. Yeah, a lot of the solutions to it, um, probably by virtue of being a physics system, means that they feel really fussy and messy. And mm. yeah, like I, I bumbled through things. And thought, is that really the way <laughs> I was going to do it? No, I haven't gone back to Jack, so I assume it is. <laughs> but I'm in a, uh, in a cave at the moment, being mobbed by these horrible spider things, and they um, they don't attack you directly. They kind of uh, bounce and stick to whatever they bounce, even if it's a you know a vertical object or something like that. And then, like a second later, then they bounce again towards you. But as soon as they they touch you, they they hurt you, and you drop anything that you're holding. And like eight of them attack you at once, and you're just trying to pick up a stick so you can hit one of them. <laughs> and uh, every time you get, you know, you hit, you're dropping the stick again. You're like, oh, Jesus, <laughs> fuck you, physics. But um, yeah, maybe it's really good. I don't know yet. <laughs> <laughs> it's really, it's really beautiful, and uh, the sound in it is amazing. Game should be easier, I think. <laughs> yeah. Solve a lot of these problems. <laughs> yes, if only the little herbal had a machine gun or something like that. We saw this all right. I oh, know. I think when games. Uh, it feels like they're arbitrarily stopping you from doing something that, you know, thwarting your intentions when it's the correct intention. Especially in a mm. puzzle situation, that's that's just wrong. Yeah. Like like in the swindle, jumping up those double block spaces. And you feel like you've, you've solved that, I, that, that it's problem. Like, I, yeah, I just, I know mm. what I want to do, you know what I want to do, uh, and then, but some quirk of the way that this mm. particular thing is designed means that it's not happening. And that should just always happen if, you, mm. if you've got the puzzle right or the thing you want to do right. Yeah. I also played um, The Cradle uh, oh, yeah. this week, which is uh, a game which I, uh, I've only played a few hours of, so it may or may not yet be set in a coma. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Always a risk with indie games. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but it's, it appears at least to be set in a far future Mongolia, uh, where you're you're living in a year, you've woken up, you have an easier, and you're surrounded. Uh, you've got a, there's a robot in your, your in your tent, an android who appears to be inert, and there's lots of material around you which suggests that some kind of calamity has occurred, which has caused humanity to uh, uh, abandon their human bodies and move their consciousnesses into androids on mass. Oh, awesome. But it's it's really interesting. There's and it's, it's it's gorgeous as well. You kind of it's not quite. It's a huge environment, and there's um, Lots of weird stuff around it. You're on the step, you know, it's beautiful. It kind of rolls off into the distance. The big lake nearby, and uh, uh, there's a, an eagle who has a what appears to be a flower instead of a heart, and uh, there's a, a, a what appears to be some kind of giant um, uh, amusement park uh, with lots of contaminated, don't enter here signs. But it's, uh, yeah, it's really intriguing, uh, very interesting. But... Uh, <coughs> Kind of a shitty point and click adventure as well. Like, <laughs> uh, you have to pick up objects in exactly the right order in order to combine those same objects, uh, right. which is just shite. You know? mm, yeah. Was uh, it first person walk around you? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, sorry, yeah. First person the puzzle robot. adventure. I've seen the trailers, and uh, you're kind of rebuilding the robot in your mm. space for uh, at least a part of it, it seems. Um, and they seem to do this really interesting thing with kind of. They always have like. A video of real human eyes mm. on the animation of the face of the robot, which was just a really disconcerting, interesting effect when I saw it in their trailers. I, I was trying to work out if they were human or not, because mm. like, they move very much like human eyes, and they blink, and the, the eyes move around, and she frowns and stuff. Yeah. Um, it seems to be a recording of human eyes that, mm. just I mean, in terms of technical terms, they've put onto a surface. It's a very sophisticated animation rig, if it isn't. Yeah, uh, yeah, it's just really, really interesting. Yeah, intriguing game. I'll probably talk about it next week when yeah. I decide whether it's in a coma or not. <laughs> or purgatory. Coma, yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. I've been playing another game mm-hmm. that, for all I know, takes place in a coma or in purgatory. <laughs> <laughs> a world in which you are trapped within stadiums that seem to have no crowds, oh, but that... yet you can hear their screams. <laughs> and cars that have no drivers... Spooky. Yes, be yeah, wear hats. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, wear hats. I've been playing Rocket League, um, which we've talked about on the podcast before. Right. Um, but I only came to after that podcast because when I originally saw it, I thought that looks like an Unreal Tournament mod from 2003. Why the fuck would I want to play that? <laughs> and then I was convinced by the strength of your argument, Tom, and Chris's, mm. that it was fucking great. Yeah. And it's fucking great. And I love it because it just seems to remove all of the obstacles that sit between you and joy in most <laughs> games. Um, it's the kind of 
opposite like of what you were just describing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what all, all, all three of you just seem to describe <laughs> games of enormous complexity and difficulty and fiddliness. Mm. And Rocket League is a game which is about the joy of a car that goes quickly, but in a world with no corners. <laughs> so there's no frustration of spinning out or crashing into the walls mm. or going off because uh, you took the corner wrong, you didn't break. You never have to break. The walls just start from <laughs> big ramps. Mm. So if you crash into the wall, you just drive up the wall and then you've got perfect grip so you don't fall off. <laughs> um, and it's a, a football game at the same time, which removes all the fiddliness of having to remember 16 different buttons mm. in order to do anything. You just jump at the ball. And even though I miss the ball most of the time, jumping's still quite fun. Especially <laughs> <laughs> like saving past the like, I'm still having fun! <laughs> yeah. I, still, I still have a little wee in my head <laughs> every time. I, I haven't learned that you have to jump before you reach the ball, rather than jumping when you're underneath the ball <laughs> when you're going at 100 miles an hour. So I miss it more often than not. And I've I scored a few on goals, and I've scored... Uh, <laughs> I've I've missed a lot of potential saves when the ball was slowly trundling towards me. Oh, yeah. oh, no. I easily knocked it away. <laughs> yeah, I've done that. Yeah. And I've uh, flickily uh, done incredible saves <laughs> where speeding back towards my goal from the other side of the pitch, jumping, knocking it into my own bar, hitting the ramp inside my goal, spinning around, and then knocking it down the other end of the pitch in a single swift movement as if I <laughs> meant that. And did in it, all these cases, it was just fun. Did it correctly give you points for the save? Yes. Because I noticed it says save sometimes and I wonder, how does it calculate that? Like, does it... <laughs> seems to be must... strangely good at it. Like, if yeah. you... I suppose you can just forecast where the ball would have gone if nothing had hit it and then say, well, would have gone in the goal, so... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's got... I think there's three different messages. There's one for clearance, which yeah. is where if yeah. you're in your somewhere near your goal and you knock it far away there's right. save and then I think there's epic save <laughs> which is where I, also, I guess it's something to do with on, the height and the speed of the ball well, I think. Uh, that's if you're shooting yeah. you get shot on yeah. target the, the, um, there's also middle ball which is basically crossing if you cross into the area yeah. you get a middle ball bonus which is like the, one of the fascinating things about it is that it's kind of like football five aside football even mm-hmm. though there's only three of you but the kind of chaos and like you do better when someone is back near the goal and a lot of the things that... So, Rocket League, when people first play it, they play it like children, children's <laughs> playground football, where everyone runs at the ball. Like, this is what happens in year five when everyone's playing football in the playground. Everyone just runs to the ball because they want to kick it because they want to be part of the game. Uh, but football is actually about, like, controlling space as much as it is about manipulating the ball. And then as soon as you start playing that way in Rocket League, then you do way, way better. And, you you know, if you're near the goal, you can actually clear it. And that's kind of football, which is really weird. Because yeah. a lot of football games fail at that, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> which is really interesting. Adam Saltzman um, tweeted that he'd been playing 1v1 Rocket League and then just recently graduated to 2v2 and is finding it like, amazingly beautifully elegant and as long as you don't get prepared with someone who's completely terrible at it, um, uh, just like a really genuinely beautiful game. And then he played 3v3 and he said he felt physically sick <laughs> at how gross and chaotic and nonsense it was. Amazing. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot to be said for uh, they've absolutely nailed like handling the, the, the relative speed of your cars to the space. A load of the like the really small movement stuff, like how it feels to jump, how your car orients when you've jumped once, and how it orients differently when you do a double jump. <laughs> so your car spins differently when you've jumped twice, and it, you know if you want to do lateral spins, you'll jump once and laterally spin. If you want to do a crazy kind of backflip with vertical spins, if you can do that more ably if you have second jumps. There are just loads and loads of intricacies to the way that movement works that feel absolutely fantastic. They've clearly just been designed to death. <laughs> just like people <laughs> playing at loads and loads and tweaking values. Um, and that's like to be tremendously admired. That's why it feels so joyous to play. It feels like it makes each one of those individual interactions incredibly easy. Like It's really yeah. generous with, with grip, obviously, if you're driving along a wall and mm. you can just cling to it but the handbrake turn for example which you can turn 180 degrees almost instantly and then get back to your maximum speed almost instantly Mm. it feels like they've made all that stuff really simple because they understand that there is just simply enough complexity and a high enough skill ceiling in trying to hit a ball into a goal (laughs) you don't need to make any of the other distinct interactions (laughs) difficult what a game it's good what does your car look like Graham? uh I, I change it quite a lot. At the moment, I've got a wizard hat, a smiley face on the end of my antenna, and when I boost, rainbows come out. Oh, awesome. I want the rainbow boost. Good combination. Shall we do questions from questions? 
<laughs> the roar of approval echoes throughout the hills. <laughs> Jake Stullery writes, Dear my wallet in early access, if you could take a weapon or power-up from one PC game and put it into another, what would you choose? I, for one, would love a rocket launcher and quad damage in Euro Truck Simulator. It would make traffic jams a whole lot more fun. Keep up the brain work. Have any of you guys been to Australia? And if so, what did you think? P.S. Can you tell my friend Zach I love him? He listens to this podcast. Well, I should hope so. Jake. Zach, your friend Jake loves you very much. I've never been to Australia. I've never been to Australia. No, me neither. No, nor have I. I'm well, it does sound like it's full of things that would likely kill me. Yeah. It does sound like, in my head, it's like Splunky in a desert. <laughs> <laughs> platforming That's through various challenges that will kill you. Splunky is a documentary about Australia. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure it's much nicer. Hmm. I'd like Infinite C4 in Journey. <laughs> <laughs> I want the uh, uh, sort of nanobot dissolvey gun from Red Faction Guerrilla oh, yeah. in the swindle. <laughs> so I can get to all those fucking terminals. <laughs> I want the gravity gun from Half-Life 2 in Mirror's Edge because that would feel like a swift way to deal with enemies in combat. In oh, like the super gravity gun. Yeah. Well, or, no, I was just, just thinking about it, like grabbing it. bits of office furniture in all those yeah. lovely interior yeah. spaces and using them <laughs> to throw them at the guards. Mm. Well, I mean, yeah. Tossing them off buildings. Tell you what, I would Just like would off. be it's not a I suppose, is it power? I'd, I'd like the um, the physics enabled grappling animations that were originally shown for Splinter Cell Conviction, but in any game where there's office furniture, so you can pick up. Might be good in, in, in Mirror's Edge as well. Might yeah, be. that would be great. Maybe I don't know. Probably won't be in Mirror's Edge too, will it? Probably not. But they, I think they have said that there won't be usable guns now. Mm. Yeah. Um, but there is still <laughs> combat, isn't there? Yep. Yes. You just have to kick them really hard. I hope that's not a quick time event. I don't mind if it's like um, on a person per person basis. Like you run up to somebody, then you press B to dodge, and then A each time, you know? Well, from what they've shown, it sounds like, and what they've said, it sounds like it's about they want to combine it with the movement, so it's about picking up speed. And once if you have enough speed and you're running at someone and you get to them before they shoot you, then you hit them really hard and they're, they're out. Oh, okay. Whereas if you're standing right next to them and you try and get a run up point blank, you would probably won't do anything. Hmm. You won't be able to non-lethally kick them out of the eighth story. <laughs> they should just That's... add the slide kick from fear. <laughs> yeah, you could do a slide kick. Everyone missions. <laughs> you could do a slide kick, but um, uh, it wasn't like fears because uh, the combat in Mirror's Edge was just bullshit in so many ways. But just under certain arbitrary conditions, it would do nothing at all, and other times it would uh, actually do damage. But in slight, the slide kick in fear. I know from my friend Steve Gaynor, who worked on one of the expansions, <laughs> does something like 10,000 damage. It's like a <laughs> powerful thing in the game. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. Talking well, of Gaynor and uh, the possibility of using gravity gun in games, with Gone Home, <laughs> where you had the gravity gun, when you played Gone Home, did you completely trash the place or did you put everything back where you found it? I put most things back. I put, yeah, I put I it back. This, this, is, this is the dividing line. <laughs> yeah. This is the psychopaths and the sensible people. Yeah. I don't know, well, it's Did like you a path, I put everything back. Apart from the yes. mixtapes, which I couldn't fucking stand the music, so I made a point of throwing them all into the toilet. Uh, okay, okay, that makes sense. Um, yeah. Sarah Dighton was saying she played it just for the music, and I thought, oh, Chris Rimo's brilliant incidental soundtrack. No, Heavens to Betsy. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, I only put things back because I had a put back button, like uh, as a prompt to put things mm -hmm. back, so it felt like it was almost telling me to do that, and if I hadn't had that, and... My uh, my choice was to either throw it randomly or try and carefully shove it back where I put it with my ham-fisted ham hands. <laughs> I probably would have thrown everything everywhere. But I, I, I used it as a way of tracking my progress. Because mm. I knew if a book was on the floor, I'd read it. <laughs> <laughs> if a drawer was open, I'd looked at it. That's a good point. I do uh, view that in other games. Mm. Funny, in fact, in the cradle, there's no easy way to put the things back where you found them. So you just end up kind of like picking up things and like, yeah, that my its purpose has been used and just <laughs> slinging it across the room. I you should be able to set fire to the things you're talking about. Just stamp <laughs> repeatedly until <laughs> so they're nothing. I had a terrible time in Skyrim because when I started playing it, I was just like, uh, it was before I was really into the game and real didn't realise then that I was going to spend 70 or 80 hours in it. Mm. And Skyrim's very good at remembering where objects are in oh, its yeah. world, actually. So whenever I went into a banquet hall, uh, <laughs> yeah. in the first five hours, I was like, YOLO, just kind of dance, <laughs> like, kicking oh, everything off the tables. <laughs> uh, yeah, just using various spells and just like blowing tables everywhere. And then when I was really invested 20 hours later, I was like, oh, this, this isn't canon. I just hate myself for being so disrespectful to the, you know. You were a younger man then. Uh, I was. Unschooled <laughs> in the ways of the world. Younger and wronger. 
<laughs> more weddings to throw tables everywhere. That's amazing. It's like you actually grew up in the game. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> if you'd been an infant when it started, it would have made perfect sense. Uh, yeah. It's like a Skyrim in the Judd Apatow film. But uh, yeah. everyone else in that game is a child because no one put anything fucking back in uh, you know, the king's chambers when I kick everything everywhere. <laughs> What's wrong with you idiots? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Dragon Ball, come on. <laughs> Adam writes, Dear Great Crow and Bar, Fallout 4 will apparently have a dozen companions for you to romance and presumably give a good scene to at some point. (laughs) Why don't games offer more non-sexy relationships with companions? Why does the end goal always have to be nobbing? I'm not against naughty bed romantics in games, even though it's usually done pretty badly, but some variety would be welcome here. Do you think it's down to the complexity of stimulating any kind of proper relationships, or do devs just really like modelling naked bodies? Are there any RPGs that have managed good companion relationship dynamics without a sexy prize at the end? In the end, is it always going to come down to an approval bar, visible or otherwise, and picking the right conversation options to unlock the nudity? Adam. I feel like there was a lot, certainly before Mass Effect, of, like... I feel like before Mass Effect, I, Mass Effect might be the first sex scene I saw in a game that I can remember. And before that, there were still loads of love interests, and it was just sort of implied that you were sort mm. of in a relationship, but you didn't really see anything. And then cut to these days, and in Wolfenstein, the yeah. whichever one it is, the order, not the expansion, um, <laughs> it's just outright fucking all over the place. <laughs> <laughs> see it all. Well, it's only two scenes. But yeah, I think I think it's quite restrained. I don't think you see a nipple in it. <laughs> I noticed these things. <laughs> Not a single dong. Um, so, is the argument the question of that um, all, like most RPG relationships, are cheapened by the fact that they all intersect? Some, they, not all of them do at all, do they? No, I don't think so. I mean, well, I think the argument is probably that, that it's hard to have a romantic relationship in which sex isn't used as a kind of prize which seems to cap off the, oh, possi- the upper limit of the relationship. Right. You know? yeah. That's always the goal. And then when you've bogged somebody, job done. Relationship sorted. That's in the case. Relationship arc concluded. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you've, you've well, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think that's true. I'm I'm from, from what, I mean, you've played Dragon Age Inquisition, yes, right? Yeah. Uh, and I've, I've seen... You know, maybe it's just uh, Chris's in, in, enlarged enthusiasm for that game that makes it sound like it's more complex than it is. But from what he said about those relationships, it does seem like there's more depth than post bonk. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I think also Chris mentioned rightly in Dragon Age Two, Abilene is a great character, like mm. who just isn't into you, mm. <laughs> and uh, that relationship is about something else entirely. And you know that becomes apparent, after, you know, at a mature point where you both admit to, she admits to you that. Sorry, you've been, you know, people chasing her and she says, no, mm. not really into it. Uh, and that actually is relatively unusual, so maybe it is the case. <laughs> it's just expected that most... Yeah, that was notable because, <laughs> yeah, because it was the exception of buffer at the end. Yeah, for sure, for sure, maybe. I think maybe it's a case where a lot of companions or relationships in games that are uh, connected to mechanics, mm. it's often that you can... that it, it leads towards sex. Mm. I don't Like, most of the time, if you've just got a really good platonic friend in a game, then that is just a plot thing that happens regardless or is pre-existing. Hmm. Most of the time it's, you know, if there's... I mean, mechanics are mostly shit anyway, you know, you just give them loads of gifts. But you never give them, you know, loads of gifts to your grizzled same-sex mentor so he respects you more <laughs> and gives you a friendly <laughs> pat on the back at the end. <laughs> you know, it's... it's yeah. I remember in Star Trek Elite Force 2, <laughs> I had a love interest, um, and it was it was kind of, um, it felt like it was written for the male protagonist, but you could also choose a female protagonist, and so they just kept the same love interest, and it just turned out she was bisexual, presumably, and if you play as a woman, then you are into ladies, and <laughs> the whole um, romance just unfolds word for word the same. <laughs> Well, that hasn't really gone down in the annals of history as being... Uh, no, not particularly brave. I guess because people recognised it as primarily lazy. <laughs> 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 I don't know for sure, but that's... <laughs> it's, it's the great bravery of GTA V, where even as a woman you can go pick up a prostitute and have her suck your invisible cock. Because <laughs> you're a woman. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> hmm. Yeah. Games are awful. Anyway, so... <laughs> yeah. Michael writes, Hi, fellow. Oh, my goodness, it's the international. I'm so excited. Um, <laughs> to talk to here. the wrong crowd here. 
Chris talked a while back about a particular game giving you different colored fuses to use on your remote bombs, and how this seemed to be a direct improvement on how it's normally done. This reminded me of what Rise of Nations did with control groups, and how much I think it's basically the best thing ever. Rise of Nations took the command group mechanism common to so many RTSs, and with a couple of little tweaks made it vastly better, by simply including the F keys as well as the numbers, allowing units to be in more than one group at a time, and allowing buildings to be assigned to control groups, they made such a huge change to my enjoyment that it's still one of the main reasons I revisit that game, and I can't for the life of me work out why the rest of the genre didn't adopt those improvements. <laughs> I love, love the fact the main reason you return to that game is because it uses the F keys. <laughs> <laughs> what refinements of a mechanism do you think should have become standard but somehow didn't? Michael? We... Um uh, looked at this question ahead of time and and discussed that we think a lot of RTSs do do that. Like certainly Supreme Commander, you, I don't know if it can use the F keys, but you can assign things to more than one control group. You can mm. assign buildings to to this keys. Resonation was before that, but it feels like. But in terms of like reasons, he's saying why didn't anyone copy it? Oh, yeah. I think hmm. don't know whether they copied it, but <laughs> and Starcraft Two, as you said, certainly can you can assign a key to a building because that's yeah. how you play Zerg. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, sure. I mean, that came afterwards. Maybe, maybe, maybe Rise of the Nations did pioneer that. I mean, Rise of the Nations is a fucking great game, and it's worth going back to for loads of reasons. Yeah. Mainly because it does Age of Empires. It's the, it's the sequel to Age of Empires that should have been made, hmm. uh, after Age of Empires 2, and it improves on Age of Empires and improves the scale. It's great. Endless Legend actually has a bunch of really neat little tweaks that feel like they are things that, really sensible improvements that someone should have made ages and ages and ages ago. And it's only because these guys are making a kind of weird game that they feel like they can do it, or that they just have that fresh perspective. Mm. So um, things like when you're managing your city, uh, like you can click on a city and manage its production queue and where all its people are, and there's interface for that. But there's also a screen where you can have an overview of all your cities, and you can see their individual, like what everyone's building, and if there are any that aren't building anything, and where all their people are and stuff. Um, and you can do all that in Galsiv, but in Endless Legend they've made that interface interactive so that you can click and drag the people around on any of those cities. So if you need to do a mass thing where like on every single city I want all of the people working on money right now, you can do that all from that one screen. Hmm. And when yeah. you click on that building queue, instead of taking you out of that interface and zooming you over to the city, you just have a building queue pop up right there and you just add to it or take hmm. it away and manage it right there and then. <laughs> and also the main menu is beautiful and it's horizontal instead of vertical <laughs> it's, uh, it's a small thing but we all have really wide and very short monitors now and that makes a lot of sense mm. and each menu option rather than just being like a bit of text that's a button is a kind of like little it's actually a bit like Google's um, what do they call that cards mm. uh, that they have where everything's like a little square and it has kind of some info with it and so new game we'll just explain what that does but then load game below it will tell you with the name and the date of your latest save game. Not only that, but clicking on that instead of the words load game actually loads that game immediately. So you can literally <laughs> get to your latest game in one mm-hmm. click. Mm-hmm. Something like that is really smart. I feel like there must be thousands of examples of this oh, yeah. that I, I completely fail to recall <laughs> because of the sheer size of the yes. task. <laughs> it's a very poor question. i tell you what I, I would like to see more of. It's not a feature in a game particularly, but in, in a game engine. You know, uh, Unity games always start up with a little box asking you yeah. what resolution to put, start the game in. That is so useful. I mean, like, I, I, I rebuilt my computer last year, and on both this computer and my previous one, um, Unreal Engine games never ever launch in the right resolution. Oh, yeah. And what they always do is that they start and then immediately minimize to desktop. <laughs> and <laughs> it, uh, I I, apparently other people have this problem as well, but it's persisted across two completely different PCs <laughs> with completely different graphics cards, everything. Um, and obviously you have to go into the any settings and, and make sure that the resolution is my native resolution. I, if you can't, if it's somehow too complicated to have a game check on startup what your native resolution is the first time you start up and start in that resolution, then just put a little box where I can say what it is. <laughs> I, used to, that. I used to wonder about that, and now that I'm a game developer, I can tell you, it's <laughs> not difficult to find out what the user's native resolution is. It's freely it. available in Windows. It's really, really easy. I would have thought Steam, or, or like, uh, rather Valve would be aware of this, but I, I reinstalled uh, episode 2 today, this, yeah. and it started in like something like 740 by 480. <laughs> 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 
the thing with like, source, what the oh, fuck? The thing with source games is that they they start in the wrong resolution, and then you go into the graphics options to change it, and then you will be going down the drop down list for resolutions, and it will go down to and the correct like, resolution. Oh, it'll say native next to it. <laughs> well, you know it's the native <laughs> resolution. Where has this gone wrong? There must be way to check that before the game launches. Maybe, but you never know what the weird quirks of an engine are really until mm. I suppose you work with it. But uh, yeah, that is. That is Weirdly frustrating. Should be mandated. When you next do your uh, your top lists of things Shit, people should never need to do. do. Yeah. yeah, yeah, we should update that. Yeah, that's on there. First against the wall. <laughs> <laughs> Henry Stenhouse writes, "What are you are your best? <laughs> <laughs> what are your best games for fun tournaments at parties? And how do you keep it fun for someone who loses early on?" <laughs> Beasts, surely. Gambies is a good. Great it's, it's a great party game. It is. If you do get knocked out early on, you do have to sort of just stand there and watch. But luckily, it's a great spectator sport. <laughs> yeah. so. It's pretty yeah. short as well in terms of rounds. Yeah. I would also just restructure your tournament so it's not a knockout thing from the beginning. Have a little mini league, even mm. if there's like four of you, and then have a playoff final to decide the ultimate winner between the top two in the league, whatever, mm. after everyone's played each other twice or something. There's a game called Button. Uh, which is a very simple game that might require some rearrangement of your front room, uh, but it stands for brutally unfair <laughs> tactics. Totally okay now. <laughs> yes, <laughs> which is a clue as to what's about to happen to you and your friends. Uh, yeah, the, so um, this you put the keyboard close to your TV and you all line up at the other side of the room, and it will tell you to do various actions, and then suddenly it will surprise you with a prompt that tells you to go and press the space bar, and then everyone in the room lunges for it. And uh, you don't have to worry about people um, being knocked out because they will be dead. Um, <laughs> physically knocked out. Physically out of action, and you don't have to worry about it then. Um, you just continue until uh, everyone is dead. You do need to I take remember. out contents insurance. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah. We um, played this uh, piece of game, I, I did like a feature on it. Um, oh, really? And like took photos, I think. Uh, and it came down to like, me and Tim Edwards, and he had to. It will give both of you a button, like his is the A button on the 360 pad and mine is Q on the keyboard and you both got to hit it like whoever can hit it the most times or the first person to hit it 35 times um, will win and so you can either concentrate on smashing your button or you can try and stop them from <laughs> doing it so we just tried things like putting our hands over the other person's button whilst trying not to press it yourself um, and then it got really difficult and Tim was blocking my button and I couldn't get to it and so I unplugged his controller <laughs> I just didn't do anything at all. and that's a brutally unfair tactic that's totally okay now <laughs> If anyone's seen the film I Art Huckabees and I've seen the fight scene in the elevator where uh, the two main characters smoosh each other in the face and so they're both on the floor and completely dishevelled that's a, that's a hint of what's about to happen to you if you try and play button It's that the game basically Skew writes Huge debate in the CNC Dota Guild about cauliflower cheese. Could each of you quickly give a yay or nay about liking it? Oh God, no. Nay. I haven't had it since I discovered that I like cauliflower, so I don't really know, but last time I had it, I didn't like it. I like cauliflower, I like cheese. Cauliflower cheese turns my fucking stomach. <laughs> I used to I, I used to love it. As far as I know, I still do. I haven't had it for many years. But it used to be a, a staple of uh, my parents' wow. Sunday roasts. If you can smother something in cheese and it's not good, you've got problems. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that should sure. be, that's easy mode in cooking. <laughs> if you can smother something in cheese, then it should automatically be great. I'm really not a fussy eater either, but I do draw a line in cauliflower cheese. Having seen some of the conversations around this in uh, our dose community... And I will be dead before the next podcast happens, assassinated, <laughs> perhaps turned into a form of cheese and, uh, you know, administered to a different food stuff. I just never liked cauliflower of any kind. I love cheese, but uh, even like cheese cannot save cauliflower for me. Oh, I like it. <laughs> we all have different opinions on this. Yeah. Like, we're, even those of us who agree on the actual... Like, no, it's broccoli product. cheese. I've probably, I've probably oh, yeah. Yeah. I love that shit. Yeah. Broccoli is the cooler cousin of cauliflower. Yeah, yeah. Broccoli <laughs> is cooler than you. You're in trouble. <laughs> 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 Thomas Westergaard writes, have you ever played through yearly iterations of games in a row? I recently did it with the F1 series. It highlights the perils of having to innovate, recycle and cut content to ship an annual series. Done with COD, don't I? But that's, that's, that's the standard was never particularly high there in the first place, I don't think. So. Sports games are particularly yeah. bad for this. They always struggle. Mm. Um, especially for the, the, the lesser sports. You can kind of get away with it with football because football is just popular enough worldwide but mm -hmm. just updating it and doing some new physics stuff. But if you're Tiger Woods Golf, 
thing. Like every third iteration is a like a Batman style gritty reboot because <laughs> in between it's wandered so far away from golf it's unrecognisable as the what sport the, anymore. Wasn't there one where you like playing golf on a warship? That does ring a bell. <laughs> I just saw a video clip of it, I never played it, but like it looked like a parody because it was just so completely so out of context. Sports con- like franchises have to go get to a point where they basically have a terrible terrible game where they just strip a load of features out in order to kind of build the franchise back up again, perhaps in a new engine, perhaps not. And uh, do you think they did it intentionally? Well, I'm, I'm not. I wouldn't. I wouldn't legally uh, say that. that. <laughs> you don't have to name any names. Do you think, in in general, this has occurred? Um, I think that the generational shift between consoles is a good excuse to strip back a feature set and then gradually rebuild it hmm. uh, under the guise of moving to a new engine. But also, in an annual franchise, moving an entire game to a new engine is a fucking hard thing to do anyway mm. so maybe it's just a resource problem but um, completely unrelated games that I would like to uh, <laughs> talk about uh, include F1 2015 where actually I think they said that 2014 was supposed to be the the one where they were you know, upgraded the engine but 2015 um, according to like our review that I was reading his review and they've just apparently stripped loads of stuff out of it in terms of game modes things that you might like career mode stuff has been totally stripped down. Is that the most recent one that just came out? Yeah. Because it's the one before that got absolutely slammed for basically yeah, the same, same thing. thing. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, for sure. Uh, and that's what yeah, that's what they said. And then this one apparently is has lost more more <laughs> ways to play. Uh, you misunderstood uh, the concept. Yeah. You strip it down and you just keep stripping it down. <laughs> apparently the driving models are better, according to our review I don't know anything about racing games, so I don't want to make any value judgments. Uh, but yeah, apparently a lot of the other stuff has been stripped out. And I, uh, recently I've, I've been um, getting back into the WWE recently, um, just because it's a, just a stupid... They still make those. ...soap opera. And they still make those games. And in fact, the last one uh, was 2K15, and they the re- like the roster of wrestlers was so out of date. And they, like there were groups that were together that were now just individual superstars that were you know stars in their own right that were still back in their old tag teams and stuff like that. And a lot of the kind of mechanics weren't right, and there were a lot of game modes and stuff that weren't in there that were in previous editions of like 2K. And suddenly all that stuff was gone. And sticks like it, the idea of it was that okay, now it's on PS4, now it's on Xbox One, and but it doesn't look good. <laughs> it's not a good-looking game. Like they've not put a huge amount of effort into making that thing look like a next-generation game in the same way that I remember the old Fight Night games were great for just creating these crazy realistic sweaty fighters yeah. and, um, and the, the, those were great games I loved the um, kind of the Gamecube uh, fight night games and then you, you look at like all the effort and, uh, that's gone to that and all the passion for the sport of boxing and the way they adopt they try to adopt this analog control system where the two sticks sticks were the big new thing now in this new generation they tried to create an entirely analog system for punching people that was <laughs> really fucking crazy and awesome <laughs> uh, and I, I, we had so much fun with those games but then you look at something like 2K15 and you realise that yeah, this is just the booting out of the door with a big uh-huh. stamp of the big WWE stamp on it and then 2K16 they've, uh, it's supposed to be out I think later this year but they've not shown any in-game footage of it mm, maybe they, uh, <laughs> they need to st- patch out all the Hulk Hogan appearances <laughs> oh well, yeah they have to do that that's for sure um, <laughs> all they've shown so far is um a video of a pre-order bonus which lets you play as the Terminator <laughs> in the new game. Oh yeah, I saw that. <laughs> <laughs> um, with accompanying live action video of a uh, very old looking Arnold Schwarzenegger walking into a bar with um, some wrestlers. And uh, <laughs> and the, the cover which is Stone Cold Steve Austin who... Um, wow, he's is, still is, alive. Doesn't, he's still te- <laughs> technically alive. Doesn't, <laughs> technically. Doesn't, doesn't wrestle anymore. <laughs> Uh, and yeah, that's all they've shown. It's just just total marketing fluff of a game that's supposed to be out relatively mm-hmm. soon. So yeah, it is worrying for like old wrestling games. Get wrestling games used to be fantastic. Who's making the WWE games these days? Ukes. Sorry, Ukes, I think. Oh. Who's making that? Uh, uh, Y-U-K-E-S, I think. Yeah. It means absolutely nothing to me. Yeah, <laughs> no, me neither. But uh, yeah, as, as, again, a, a franchise that has dipped for. Reasons maybe it feels like it should be more popular than it is. Maybe mm. maybe it just sells no matter what they do. Maybe it sells to people who don't play many games. But I would assume that actually there's quite a huge crossover between people who like games and people who like wrestling and stuff. Yeah. 
Mm. I've always wanted a wrestling game that was more of an RPG. I don't care about mm. the fight so much. I want to have like dialogue trees where I'm choosing what stupid things to say <laughs> in the post and pre-match interviews. <laughs> they used to do um, that. Like No Mercy used to do that, and mm. you'd heard a bit of that in SmackDown Two as well. Like they were some, there were some really good wrestling games back in the day. The Attitude Era ones. Mm. And that's all the time for questions we have. Send us more questions, please by sending them to questions at CreightonCrowbar.com or tweeting them at CreightonCrowbar or writing them on our forum, which is at CreightonCrowbar.com forward slash forum. Or you can tweet us individually. I'm at Marsh Davis, D-A-V-I-E-S. I am at Gonis, G-O-N-N-A-S. And I am at Pentadact, P-E-N-T-A-D-A-C-T. I'm at PCT Ludo, spelled L-U-D-O. And thanks to everybody who's... Uh, gone to our Patreon and gave us money. You can yeah, still do yeah. that if you so wish. Uh, that's <laughs> patreon.com slash Creighton Crowbar. Quite logical, really. Don't um, know why I didn't remember it. <laughs> <laughs> and you might even find, uh, if you want to make an individual donation, a donate. Yes, there should be a, a button on there by Friday when this goes up, which uh, gives you an opportunity to donate an individual sum if you're uncomfortable with the okay. commitment levels involved in uh, paying towards an ongoing Patreon, which is completely understandable. And th- again, thank you very much yeah, for the amount of money that you've already yeah, given us. Really that's, awesome. that's crazy. We should be able to buy some new recording equipment so the yeah. podcast sounds at least slightly less shit. <laughs> we may need to get further advice from audio professionals <laughs> before it becomes fully less shit. <laughs> and thank you for the audio professional listeners who have sent in their advice so far. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because uh, it's going to prove to be immensely useful. <laughs> we say blowing out the mic as we laugh about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Thanks. Thanks. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> <Leave the chair. laughs>